Hi everybody, Andrew Cuneo here. This time I'm going to be going over a historic deck tech for blue-white control. This is a deck I considered for the upcoming Neon Dynasty set championships, but ultimately I decided not to play, and I'm going to get into why that is as I go through the deck. This is a pretty well-established archetype in historic kind of blue-white to fairy decks, whether they're straight blue-white or Jeskai have existed for a long time. One of the appealing things about this deck is that it got a lot of new tools in Neon Dynasty that are actually pretty strong in the deck. So let's start by looking at those. So the first one is March of Otherworldly Light. As a way to exile a, a creature, this card is not that efficient, but what it is good at is you can hit artifacts and enchantments, so specifically against a black-green food deck that's going to have Witch's Oven and Trail of Crumbs. This is going to give you the ability to remove a lot of permanents that in the past you might have had a limited number of answers to. You can now just play a lot of answers. Also, because this exiles the card, this is not an efficient answer to Arclight Phoenix, but in a long game, being able to exile the Phoenixes can be good enough. It, assuming you have some other stuff, other good stuff going on, you can overcome the inefficiency of this card. The, you can pitch cards to this and kind of any any deck based around the fairy hero of Dominaria is going to have a fair amount of card draw in it. So the pitch option does actually come up. It does matter in some games. This is, I think, the strongest of the new cards. So pretty clearly a nice addition. The other new cards, well, first of all, Farewell, which I think is pretty obviously a great card against black green food. Certainly if you can stall the game to the point where you get six mana and you cast it, it's going to give you a huge advantage. The thing I found about this card that's a little bit less obvious is it's actually okay against uh, Arclight Phoenix decks, certainly in game one where they're not going to have many spell pierces or negates. So uh, a six mana sorcery is pretty likely to resolve if you get to the point to cast it. And that's, the reason it's good in that matchup is that you can exile their graveyard in addition to exiling all the creatures. So if you get to six mana, you cast this, you can be pretty confident that the next their, their next turn is not going to be that good. Because usually by the time you've gotten to six mana, they've kind of already done their flurry of spells to get the phoenixes out. And they're maybe in play, they're maybe in the graveyard, depending on the way the game is played out. But this is going to be able to exile their whole graveyard, meaning that they're not going to have Faithless Looting sitting in their graveyard, you know, waiting to give them a good turn. Their Dragon's Ridge Channelers, if they play them out of their hand, are still just going to be 1-1s. One so I would not I would not sleep on this card, certainly in the Black-Green Food matchup, or if you play against a new Oni Cult Anvil deck, this is a great card. Don't sleep on this card as a Game 1 answer to Phoenix. I think in the sideboard of games, you're going to want to look for ways to do better than this, just because they're going to have more spell pierces in the gates. So a six mana sorcery speed card is really not what you're going to want in a sideboarded game. The third and final new card is one that, it was not immediately obvious to me that this was going to be a good card in blue-white control, but I do think it is good. So it's the Wandering Emperor. This is kind of a, in some ways it's just four mana flash, exile a creature, you gain two life. But it does do better than that if you're playing in the mirror, uh, just being able to flash in the, the samurai tokens and get more samurai tokens as the game progresses allows you to pressure planeswalkers. The fact that this gains you a little bit of life matters. The fact that you can just sit with this card up and also memory deluge and you only cast that wandering emperor if you need to, and then you just deluge it. It's, it's, it's just a card that slots nicely into this deck. And my expected metagame for Historic at the, at the set championship was Food and Phoenix being kind of the two decks to beat, and then maybe a, a Blue-White Control Mirror being another important deck, maybe a, a Blue-White Auras deck based around Core Spirit Dancer. And in all of those cases, Wrath of God is really not a very good card, or Day of Judgment, whichever one you want to play. They, they're functionally the same in Historic. But there are not a lot of good matchups for Wrath of God. Sometimes people play Settle the Wreckage instead because they think it's a little bit better against Phoenix. I really am not a fan of playing the Settle the Wreckage at all. I think it's just too inefficient of a card. I think the Wandering Emperor 
is just a better version of Settle the Wreckage. If that's something that appeals to you, I think the Wandering Emperor is going to be stronger. Obviously, the Wandering Emperor cannot dig you out of the situation where you're being attacked by six creatures. That's a game you're probably going to lose. But the Wandering Emperor just overall is going to be better in a lot more spots, I would say. Those are the three new cards that made me want to try the deck. And I guess there are also the, the new lands, Odawara and Aganjo. Those, I would say, are really minor upgrades. The three white cards are the big upgrades you get with Neon Dynasty, and they're all good. I, I think they all definitely improve the deck. Looking at the way the rest of the deck is constructed, I've got uh, one Soul Guide Lantern and one Rest in Peace in the main. And this is kind of getting into why I'm not playing the deck in the set championship. I think this deck is just not good against the Is It Phoenix decks, or it's not good enough. Like I, I would not want to take a deck to a big tournament that I thought had an actively bad matchup against Phoenix. And I think this deck is clearly not a favorite if you're playing against Phoenix. The Phoenix deck is not a huge favorite against you, but you're an underdog. And I, I just didn't want to play a deck that I thought that was the case. So I was trying to fix that by adding a Soul Guide Lantern to my main deck, by playing a main deck Rest in Peace. And these things help, but they just they just don't go far enough. Um, one thing I would say about Rest in Peace is a lot of the times if you look at somebody's blue-white control list in Historic, they're going to have like three Rest in Pieces in their sideboard, which to me says that they've also come to the conclusion that their de deck is not good against Phoenix. But I just don't think Rest in Peace is that good out of the sideboard against Phoenix. The Phoenix decks always see it coming. They always have a sideboard plan where they shift to boarding in more Planeswalkers or they take out some of their stuff that's graveyard dependent. So it's very easy to lose games, especially sideboard games, where you resolve Rest in Peace and they just kill you with their other threats. And the more Rest in Pieces you put in your deck, the worse it becomes because you're just more likely to draw two of them and just lose to a Chandra or just lose to just... Arclight Phoenix is cast from their hand that you can't answer. This card, it if it doesn't completely shut down what your opponent's doing, it can be a bit of a liability. That's why I like it better in game one, because in game one it comes closer to shutting down the whole Phoenix deck. And also the fact that it's a white card means that in matchups where it's bad, you can get some efficiency back by pitching it to March of Otherworldly Light. I've only got one Fateful Absence in my deck. Uh, basically, these got trimmed to just have more March of Otherworldly Lights. This is still a fine card. I've got another one in the sideboard, which would be mostly to answer other Planeswalkers. Two Dovin's Vetoes in the main deck. This is one I don't feel strongly that you, you need to play two in the main deck. I think you could play one, maybe. I probably wouldn't play zero, but if you wanted to fit something else in the deck, I could see trimming this. I've got one sensor and two Jewari Disruptions. This is another thing I don't feel that strongly about. I think Jewari Disruption is kind of a bad card in Historic. I was playing with it throughout testing because it's a card that's gotten some popularity in blue-white Historic lists. I think the deck that it makes more sense in is if you're playing with Lotus Field. I think it makes sense to play with it. Probably, if I hadn't abandoned this deck, these would have eventually been replaced with just lands. Two Divine Purges, this is the only card that is in my main deck that I actively do not think is a good card against Is It Phoenix, but it is a very good card against food, and one of the appealing aspects of this deck, I think, is you just have a good matchup against food decks. So I didn't want to cut all the cards from the main deck that, like, I, I didn't want to change the main deck to make it good against Phoenix to the point that I gave up on the fact that it was good against the food decks, that's why I've still got two of those. I'm not 100% sure you should be playing with any of them, to be honest. I think you could reimagine this deck as a deck that doesn't play any Divine Purges, and maybe you play one or two Portable Holes, and then you you know, you know, maybe would need to shore up some different matchups in, in the sideboard, because there are other places where Divine Purge is good. It's good against like a Blue-White Auras deck. It's good against, uh, it, if you're playing against somebody who's just putting a lot of artifacts into play, they're generally going to be cheap artifacts, so that's pretty good. I don't love this card, but I, I do, I it does have, it's really powerful in some of the matchups in Historic, which is why I'm still playing with it. 
Three Narsets in the main deck. I think this card is just exceptionally good in this deck and just in Historic in general. This is one of the things that I really wanted to play three copies of it. So I think it's a good card against Phoenix. It is not like a lights out game over card if you resolve it, but it does, it slows them down in a meaningful way and it, it gives you more access to your, your main deck Rest in Peace or Soul Guide Lantern because it digs you through your deck. It is something that they're forced to respect. Like they, they can't just, if you play it, they really realistically cannot ignore it and it just attack you. They have to attack you, have to attack the Narset and kill it if they're not going to win the game that turn. So just generally a solid card. I also think it's an actively good card against food. Uh, I think the food deck's just pretty bad at pressuring it and getting it off the board. So you're going to wind up getting two cards out of it most of the time. Also, their decks generally have Deadly Dispute in them, which it, it's good against Deadly Dispute. That's a pretty minor thing, but it does matter. For Archmage's Charms, this is kind of a mainstay of this archetype. I would not play a blue control deck in Historic without four copies of this card. And you need to warp your mana base around this card, which when we get to the mana base, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Three Memory Deluges. This is perhaps more than you should be playing. And maybe given that there's three Narsets, you could trim one of these if you wanted an additional Sweeper in your deck, or if you wanted to play an additional Soul Guide Lantern. This is a card I could see maybe trimming on. I like playing three, but it, it's... It, this is not... I, would, I, I wouldn't say that this is an important number of Memory Deluges to play if you want to play something else. Just one Wrath in the, in the main deck that... When you're going to play with a lot of Narsets and Memory Deluges, it is good to have a diversity of answers to things. So uh, Wrath does give you a particular kind of answer. So there's sort of four Sweepers in the main deck with two Purges, a Wrath, and a Farewell. And you've got a fair amount of ways to find them. So you do have a pretty good capacity to sweep the board, perhaps not as much as in some builds. Four Teferi Hero of Dominaris. I've seen some lists trying to play three... I guess that makes a little bit of sense to me. I, I think four is better, but I, I don't hate three. Uh, three Shark Typhoons. This is another card that I think is just generally a good card. I'm pretty happy to play with it. Uh, one Commit. I'm a big fan of playing Commit Memory, especially when you're playing Narset. Like, that's a pretty clear combo that's just great. I also, I like Commit against food decks. I think Commit is not a good card against Phoenix. I mean, I think it's a card you're going to want to sideboard out. It is not an unplayable card against Phoenix. It's also pretty nice to have commit in your deck if you're going to be playing mirrors or if you're going to be playing against Aura's decks. One of the keys to beating Aura's decks is you don't want to get in a spot where you just can't beat a Core Spirit Dancer plus uh, the dog that gives it indestructible. The dog that gives your creatures indestructible is pretty weak against this deck the way it's constructed. There's very few effects that it protects against. And... Commit, especially if you get to play against people who are playing Kaya's Ghost Form out of Auras. Commit is exceptional because it gets around Kaya's Ghost Form. So those are the spells. Going over the lands, the lands is something I tend to feel pretty strongly about in these control decks. And there's... So one land that I do not have in my deck is Castle Ardenvale. I just don't think that is a good card in Historic anymore. I think the... The point at which you could actually be accomplishing something by spending five mana to make a 1-1 one, one in Historic is long past. It's really only a card that's even remotely effective if you happen to play the Mirror, and in the Mirror you'd much rather be spending all of your mana it, later on in the game on Shark Typhoons or Memory Deluges, not making 1-1s. One, so I, I, I think that that's a card that it would be fine to play, except for the fact that you want to make Archmage's Charm really castable in your deck. So I just would not put Castle Ardenvale in my deck anymore. Similarly, I think Castle Vantress is really weak. It allows you to cast Archmage's Charm, and that's fine. But I think the idea that you're going to win many games by spending five mana to scry with it is just not true. It is just a pretty... It, it's pretty sad when you get to the point where that is the best use of your mana on a given turn. I, I, my experience is you very rarely activate this card when you've got it in your deck. The first one, I guess, is kind of free, so I'm still playing it, but I'm not a fan of it. 
If they printed an additional different land that gave you value, I, I could easily see cutting this card. Two Hall of Storm Giants. I like this card a lot in this deck, mostly for playing mirrors. I, I think it's really important to, as an additional way to play to kill Planeswalkers. And if you look at the way I've constructed my deck, I only have one Fateful Absence, so there is a bit of a weakness to Planeswalkers out of this deck. But having two Hall of Storm Giants kind of compensates for that in a sense. Uh, four basic lands, three islands, and a plains. I think that's fine. I don't think you need to play more than that, certainly. Uh, there's nothing in this deck that... There, there's no Field of Ruin. There's no Fabled Passage. There's nothing... You're not actively searching the basics out of your deck. It's really just uh, protecting you against opposing Field of Ruins. And it, you could play fewer if you wanted. But... There are four Glacial Fortresses in this deck, and you want them to come into play untapped, and playing four basics does allow you to do that. I, I could see some people saying, well, why don't you just play another Castle of Antris over an island? It doesn't allow Glacial Fortress to come into play untapped. And also, it doesn't allow, like, a second Castle of Antris, if you draw two of them, they're both going to come into play tapped, as opposed to one Castle of Antris, one island, where they would both come into play untapped. One Odawara. This is, I think, a very powerful addition just because it, it's a pretty powerful effect to have on a land. It's an effect that, in general, your opponent can't do anything to stop it. They need a card like Stifle to, to stop it. So it, it's pretty close to being uncounterable. Certainly, if you played against someone who's playing Auras, this would be a nice effect. It's not that great against Phoenix. One important thing to note about this card is you can use it to bounce your own Planeswalkers to your hand, which a card like Brazen Borrow, you cannot do that with. So that is a play that you might want to set up for later on in the game. Also, you do you have two planeswalk. Well, you have three planeswalkers in the deck, so you can actually get the channel cost on this. Oh, it's legendary creatures. Never mind. Moving on. Sixteen of the good dual lands. I I think that Hollowed Fountain's obviously the best of the dual lands. I think Irrigated Farmlands are good because they have the planes and island type, which enables your Glacial Fortress and your Castle. Uh, I think that's Deserted Beach is also really good. I think that's maybe the second best of the duels. Probably Glacial Fortress is the worst of the duels, just because it is a little bit dodgy getting them to play, come into play untapped on turn two. That's not always going to be the case. But I think you just want to have great mana in this deck, and there's enough good dual lands that you can do that. You're, you're trying to cast a triple blue card and a double white card, which requires you to play a lot of dual lands, so that's nice. Looking at the sideboard, it's a lot of the usual suspects for a sideboard. I do have a second rest in peace for the Phoenix matchup. Also, it helps if you play against a red-black, like, Croxa deck. Rest in peace is usually, it's it's lights out against red-black Croxa decks. Against Phoenix, it's good, but not incredible. One authority of the consoles, you can thank Gabriel and C for this still being my sideboard. He assures me it's a good card. My experience is it's basically a mulligan. So you'll have to test that out on your own and come to your own conclusions. Uh, two more Dovin's Vetoes. This is really just to play against the mirror. Also, if you played against some sort of combo deck like Indomitable Creativity or something, this is a good card in the mirror. So Mystical Disputes. I think Mystical Dispute is actively really good against Phoenix. It's also good in the mirror. It's also good, good against Merfolk. Another Soul Guide Lantern, fourth hate card. I think if you're going to stock up on hate cards for the Phoenix matchup in your sideboard, once you get to two rest in pieces, you should switch to just having Soul Guide Lanterns. Soul Guide Lantern is almost as effective as your first piece of graveyard hate as the rest in piece. And if you're going to be drawing redundant copies, you certainly want them to be Soul Guide Lanterns and not additional rest in pieces. One Ether Gust, just because it's a great card, there's no particular matchup I would say I'm targeting with this. It's just, you know, obviously only against decks that have red and green cards. I probably would not board this in against Food. If you're wondering if it's the card you want to board in against Trail of Crumbs and Ravenous Squirrel, I would say that you have better options and not to do that. Third Divine Purge, like I said in the main deck, this is a card that's great against Food. It's also great against uh, yeah, any of the decks that are designed to flood the board with lots of cheap stuff, so... I think it's a nice card to have a third access to a third copy. Hey, it's a third mystical dispute. Arena tricked me with its sideboard. But the same thing is that is true for the other mystical disputes is true for this one. 
A couple additional sweepers, additional Day of Judgment, which is kind of a catch-all if you're playing against somebody who's playing, you know, four drop, three and four drop creatures in their deck somehow. You, you just want more sweepers. Additional Farewell, this is mostly against food or just oddball decks where exiling artifacts and enchantments is good. Like, say you play against a green-white enchantress deck, this would be good. A Force Shark Typhoon, which is mostly for the mirror, and a Discontinuity, which is also mostly for the mirror. Although it is also, this is a good card if you play against someone who's trying to beat you with expensive, uncounterable cards like Thought Distortion or Nezahal. And I'm just going to take a brief moment to talk about Nezahal. We'll pull it up on the screen. This card, I think, is awful if you're going to put it in your deck and you're planning to tap seven lands and cast it. I, I would really strongly advise you don't ever play it if that is your plan with it. If your plan is to somehow cheat it into play with indomitable creativity, or maybe you've thought of a different way you think you're going to get it into play, that's fine. But don't put this card in your deck if your plan is to just put seven lands into play and then cast it. It's just really not an efficient enough card at that point. I think it's popular in these blue-white mirrors because I think that it's an easy way to win a game. Like, it's very easy to have the game play out in a way where you get to seven lands, you cast it, it works, you win the game, and you're like, wow, that was a good card. I think in practice you wind up losing more games by having that be your game plan than you would win just with the Nezahal. Like, if you think about it, if you're someone who has been struggling to win blue control mirrors and you're, you're like, I keep losing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time winning more than 40% of the sideboarded games. You board this card in, it is going to win you some games. Like maybe you, you get up to 45%, but I just don't think you can actually get to the point where you're winning more than 50% of the time against good players if this is your strategy. The problems with it are so, if they have Narset in play, you're not going to be getting the cards. Yeah, I mean, you might you might get one card on their turn if you have an if they have an unanswered Narset. If they have a Teferi in play, they're just going to tuck it. It does not help you come back from a resolved Teferi. If they have a commit in their deck, which I think a lot of people are going to have commit, get spending seven mana and getting it committed is kind of disastrous. The same thing is true of discontinuity. If people have discontinuities in their sideboard, they're going to board them in in this matchup because discontinuity is a really good answer to Shark Typhoon. And if you wind up spending seven mana on your turn for a sorcery speed creature, it's just going to get discontinuityed. And that is a really bad exchange for you too. You're, you're basically just setting yourself up for bad things to happen to you by putting the card in your deck. It's not a card that's going to allow you to get ahead early on in the game. It's a card that maybe, it's a card that really only wins if you can get to a point late in the game where you're at an even game state. And it's just going to be a dead weight in your hand until the game actually gets to that point. So I really just, every time I download a stock blue-white list and it has that card in it, I just take it out of my sideboard. And sometimes I do lose to it when I play the mirror, but I think you win more by not having it. So that's my rant on Nezahal. I hope you guys find it useful, and I hope you listen to me and don't play with it anymore. With that, let's play a few matches and see how the deck performs. On the play, I only have one white mana, since so Divine Purge is not looking exceptional, but it's obviously a fine hand. I'm going to lead on the beach because it will allow me to play the hall untapped on turn two, and then I'll have access to Dogen's Veto and March of Otherworldly Light for one if I need it. A start of Hive of the Eye Tyrant plus Inquisition of Kozlek usually means that they're playing a red black deck, but obviously you could play these cards in any black deck. All right, they're playing red black kind of as expected. Got a Croxa. It's fine. So one thing I would say about this matchup is they make you discard a ton. It's really just an attrition battle. 
And the way to win in an attrition battle like this is you just want to have as many two-for-ones as possible. So I think generally this is one of the best matchups to cast Archmage's Charm just to draw two cards. There are very few cards in their deck that are just must counter. You need to save your counters for them. You really just want to get a two-for-one so that you make sure you're making all your land drops so that you can play your Teferi when you draw it off the top of your deck. So yet again, I'm going to Archmage's Charm. So the Crocs and the Graveyard's a little bit scary. It does give them a potentially a plan. They're not happy that I drew two cards yet again. All right. In the interest of getting more two-for-ones, I am actually, I'm going to board in a Shark Typhoon here. I think Farewell is probably the sweeper I want. I think obviously you want all of your graveyard hate. Divine Purge seems kind of poor. I think I really want Wrath of God. Ether Gust is serviceable. They do usually have Planeswalkers. So I think I will play Faithful Absence. Sensor is a card that, in the past, I always used to hate sideboarding out, but I do actually think it's pretty good to board it out against this red-black deck, just because it, when you play with Sensor, it's really kind of a tempo play. The, these games are not going to come down to tempo. They're really just about trying to get as many two-for-ones as you want and trying to guard against flooding out. And Sensor does kind of tend to make you flood out, because if you think about it, in this game... The majority of the time you're going to cycle it in this matchup, so it's going to be a land almost half the time. What other cards don't I like? I think I'm just going to take these vetoes out of my deck. I don't love playing Dovin's Veto against people that have lots of Thought Seizes. And Inquisitions in their deck because what what happens is basically they have the choice of making the Thoughtseize or Inquisition trade with the veto, and they're going to do that except in spots where the card that they want to resolve is a creature, and then they're going to resolve their creature, and you're going to be stuck with the veto. So I just think it the exchange frequently goes badly for you. Oh, stupid disruption. Could have made the Inquisition whiff. I think I'm going to discard a Glacial Fortress instead of an Island, even though obviously Glacial Fortress is a better card, but the Island is an unknown card for my opponent. So maybe it makes it slightly easier or slightly harder for them to play against me. Certainly there, there isn't a reason I'm ever going to need quad white mana. I'm going to gust this Arcanist when they crack their difficult passage. The Arcanist really isn't that threatening, given that their only card in the graveyard was an Inquisition, but the Inquisition would have been able to take the gust, so I'm kind of forced to make that play. Hopefully they decide to attack and Inquisition me just because it's minus one card in the graveyard for the purposes of the Croxa. Inquisition used to be so bad in Historic when Brainstorm was legal because it would just whiff all the time. It's not quite as bad now, but it, it still whiffs an awful lot. They're going up to three cards in the yard, so they're pretty unlikely to be able to get Crocs out of the yard this time, or this turn. And then the Soul Guide Lantern can take care of it. 
Soren the Merciless. I'm in Holy Heat and a Den of the Bugbear. It's a little bit concerning. So what are my options? I can just hard cast the Shark Typhoon, which does tend to win against this red-black deck. But I don't really have that many spells in my hand. I think I'm just going to go for the Lantern on the Croxa. Play a Hall. Untap my lands and give myself access to making a 4-4 Shark. The, four, the, the Lantern makes their Unholy Heat such that I can... Generally, make it only deal two damage. I mean, they might be able to create a situation where they're forcing me to lantern, and then they could unholy heat in response. But they're pretty far away from that. All right, this is working out perfectly for me. They either didn't have an untapped land or chose not to play one. So I'm going to get to eat their den of the bugbear. My Teferi takes a little bit of damage, but I'm really not that concerned about that. And they are much more concerned about their lack of a den of the bugbear. All right, I'm on the play again. So hopefully I'm playing against someone that the rest in peace is good against. Obviously, there's no way to know. The interesting thing about this hand, which I'm certainly going to keep, is do I want to play the farmland on turn one or do I want to hold it to cycle? I think the answer is I want to play it on turn one because I already know that I have a five drop. And I'm against a lot of... I, I'm, I'm just going to play this on turn two. Versus the Den of the Bugbear and hope that they're playing Phoenix or Red Black. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to just potentially leave my Dovin's Veto up and not use it. The only rough thing is it's possible that they're just going to concede and I'm not going to know what they're playing. Play with Fire... Probably indicates they're just playing them on a red burn deck and the rest of the piece isn't going to do anything. Alright, so this is basically just a burn deck. Rest in peace is pretty useless here. Does it eventually shut this thing off? It eventually shuts off the Frenzied Geist Blaster, if that's something I'm in the market for. Did it already shut the Frenzied Geist Blaster off, or did they just not want to do any Geist Blasting? We do not know. Basically, just trying to buy time with that Divine Purge to set up for a Teferi. You've been skewered. You double skewered. Do I want to take two damage to save my Aganjo? The Aganjo is an answer to the bugbear, but they also have missed their fourth land drop, so they would need to drop two more lands. I think it's better to just save the two life. They are a deck that just keeps shocking me and skewering me, so two life is basically worth a card. I also have the Hall in my hand, which the Hall, I could set it up so it blocks the Den of the Bugbear in a turn or two, if needed. Hmm, I guess I'm just going to play the hall and pass. 
a little concerned about what happens if they just have an untapped land and just animate the bugbear. I think if they do that, I'm going to draw two cards and hope that I see a March of Otherworldly Light. This thing I think will actually counter. Does that make sense? They probably don't get the trigger, so maybe I don't need to counter it. Not really very scared about it too, too, but I am a little bit scared that of them just getting a handful of burn and killing me that way. Alright, that is a very good answer to what's to my problems. I, I should have cracked the Soul Guide Lantern in response to that. Because I definitely want to induce them into attacking into me with their Geist Blaster. Too much burn. Would I have... I guess I would have lived if I had main phase the Wandering Emperor and then just dared them to attack me with the Bugbear. They might not have done that. I don't know that I would have won the game, but I would have gotten further into the game. As much fun as Rest in Peace was that game, it doesn't seem particularly good here. I think I'm going to play Four Shark Typhoons, No Farewells. Probably no Divine Purges. Don't want all the Fateful Absences. Don't need Soul Guide Lantern. Neutrum 1 Narset. This is one of the few matchups where Narset's a little clunky. Actually, you know what? I'm going to play all the Narsets and just not play Commit. This is a matchup that I, I my deck is not really prepared for this particular matchup. I, I don't think that Burn is a top tier competitive deck. In case you were wondering why I don't have any copies of a card like Sunset Revelry in my sideboard, that is why. It's, it's just a matchup I chose to ignore. Which eventually, I'm, I'm going to make a, a video probably pretty soon about how you move from playing on the ladder into playing in tournaments. And one, one of the things you have to learn is that in order to do well in tournaments, you really want to focus preparing your deck to be good against the other top decks you expect. And you need to just accept that there are going to be some decks that you could pretty easily make your deck good against that you're just going to have bad matchups because you're just unwilling to focus your deck on beating a deck like Burn. Like, obviously, if I had three Sunset Revelries in my sideboard, this would go from what's probably a kind of hard matchup to a very easy matchup. But I'm just not willing to construct my deck in that way because I don't think that this is a deck I'm very likely to play against. If I had more lands, I would be countering those cards. As it stands, I'm concerned about my low, my low number of lands. That I will counter.
Well, Soaking Sun is probably pretty brutal out of this deck. It's a really nice draw. I was worried about what was going to happen if I didn't find an answer to the bugbear. Was I going to just play the Teferi blind and hope that I, I hit an answer? I think I probably, if I had not drawn that card for my turn, I would have just passed with memory deluge up. It's still looking pretty grim. I'm at five life and they've got the Remnant Ruins in play. And their deck is just all burn spells. Worst case is the electrostatic bolt me here. Alright. Domin's Veto is the most important card I think I can find in my deck. Because I don't have any cards that just explicitly gain life. I have the Wandering Emperor, but the Wandering Emperor is not a very reliable way to gain life when your opponent has no creatures. I also don't have any answers to the Ramanap Ruins. It's just going to do two damage to me. I can't stifle it. Can't feel to ruin it. I don't have those cards in my deck. So I draw two cards with the Archmage's Charm? Probably not. It was pretty. It was a good play by my opponent not to attack with the Bugbear and instead just use the Ruins. If they attack with the Bugbear, they're just minus one land for being able to activate the Ruins. And the easiest way for them to win is to just use this Ruins and draw a second Ruins. I, I think they would just win the game for sure if that happens. I'm pretty much just in a race to get to a Teferi Ultimate and destroy all their lands. That's the only way I'm going to win. I'm willing to cast a memory deluge here. I'm not gonna I'm obviously not gonna cast both when I have all these counters. Alright, now that they've got it spare land, this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do for their turn. I guess I could deluge, and if I hit the wandering emperor, I'd be happy with this attacking, so let's do that first. I hate it when people float mana there and then don't have a way to use it. I mean, do they really think they need to have the mana in their pool in case I do something? Because I'm not going to do anything there. It's pretty much impossible for doing that to be anything other than a waste of time. I mean, in that case, I think it was strictly impossible for that to be anything other than a waste of time. The Wandering Emperor would be a good find here because... I think you can kill your own creatures, right? Oh, should I have... I wonder if I should have killed my own shark right away to beat a Ramanop Ruins off the top. Because 
Because if they had gotten a Ramanap Ruins off the top that turn, they would have won. Now I think they probably cannot win. Only time will tell. Okay, so I'm going to pretty rapidly reduce them to zero lands. Then they'll just be trying to find a way to sneak through a final burn spell, which I, I should be able to prevent that from happening. This Narset, I guess. They're doubling down on the float mana when it can't possibly matter. I guess from their perspective, they could be thinking, okay, I have shocks in my deck. I could just draw a land and or a shock off the top of my deck, and I still have one shot to win. They don't know that I just have three counters in my hand. The only thing I saw out of that game that was a, something to maybe think about was the Roiling Vortex, but that's not particularly scary against all these March of Otherworldly Lights and the Aether Gust. Also, it just does a point of turn. I don't really have very much in the way of life gain in my deck anyway. You can also, if, if, if Roiling Vortex winds up being a huge problem, you can just minus a Teferi on it to get it off the board. Perfectly serviceable hand. It would be nice to have fewer Narsh sets in my hand and more lands, but you can't get everything you want. They did this play in the first game, too, where they went turn two, upkeep, play with fire. I guess if they wanted to skewer me, that makes sense. Uh, they wanted to light up the stage and just hope that it worked out for the next turn. I don't like that play. I don't like that play at all. Is their next turn going to be so bad that I shouldn't even leave up to our disruption and should just play it as a land. I think that the answer to that is yes.
I was wrong. <laughs> Holy cow. Wish I'd been able to counter 3-1 pro white. Wasn't thinking about that guy, that's for sure. All right, that's kind of an answer to it. It's not a great answer because they probably have a lot of cards that can kill a 1-1, one -one, but maybe it does something. I must destroy it. Oh, you know what I can also do? I can I can steal the Lava Runner with Archmage's Charm. So I'm going to go for the block this turn. If that doesn't work, hopefully I draw an untapped land. And if I draw an untapped land, I will go for steal your Lava Runner. Try to block. I'm probably falling too far behind. This game, I had too many lands coming to play tapped. And I'm dead. <laughs> Unchained Berserker. I would not have guessed that was what was going to do me in. Well, that's it for today. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. And... I hope you enjoyed my insights into blue-white. Like I said at the start, this is not the deck I chose to play at the set championship, but I do think it is a pretty good deck. And please remember to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you're liking the content, because I'm planning to make more, and it definitely helps. Thanks for watching.